The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So a little bit of housekeeping before we continue. <clears throat> First of all, uh, you may have noticed that uh, in the reading assignments, I have started um, posting from Goodman's book. So there is some pros and cons about this. Uh, Goodman is uh, very good if you are an engineer, especially electrical or mechanical engineer, because you, you, then you are very used to thinking about systems, block diagrams, transforms, and so on. So it is very nicely written this way. But it's a little bit mathematical. Uh, HECT is more on the physics side. So actually, HECT is written for uh, junior or sophomore physics students. <clears throat> uh, and of course, they're very nicely complementary. The only real downside is that they use different notations. So if you, if you try to study from both HECT and Goodman, you have to be a little bit careful to keep the notation, I mean, you know, the notation is not consistent, but you have to keep yourself from getting confused by the inconsistent notation. Uh, nevertheless, the diagrams are, of course, consistent because they both calculate the same uh, Fresnel diffraction patterns, the same Fraunhofer patterns, and so on. But you have to be a little bit mindful of the coordinates, for example, they may be used in different symbols. Anyway, I highly recommend that you study from both books. Hecht also has uh, much more intuitive explanations and many more figures and so on. Uh, but Goodman is uh, more rigorous and also better suited to an engineer's way of thinking. So that's why I use both textbooks. My notes are actually closer to Goodman from this point on. Uh, so, so that's an additional benefit. Anyway, the reading assignments are from both books. If you decide to follow just one book, for example, either Hacked by itself or Goodman by itself, you don't miss significantly. You can follow either book, but I think it, you get a complete picture if you follow both books. So, and in a way, they serve to reinforce each other. So, that, so anyway, so that, that's the story about the textbooks. A little bit more housekeeping. Uh, I have posted a slightly revised version of uh, Monday's notes. One minor correction: if you look at this, this is the very last slide from Monday. There was an error, at least one that I found, uh, in the expression for the Fourier coefficient C sub Q. Uh, it was the function sinc of Q over 2. This is correct. On Monday, uh, there was an extra pi inside the argument of the sinc function. That pi should not have been there, so I've removed it. We will see today later the derivation of this um, expression, actually a similar expression. <clears throat> So hopefully that will uh, clarify uh, matters. The other thing I did uh, compared to, to Monday, Pepe reminded me on Monday when he, did, uh, when he discussed the grading about uh, dispersion. So if you look at the, at the uh, if we go back a little bit to the expressions for uh, the diffraction angle from a grating, Okay, that's a good one. Okay, so uh, in last week we focused on a discussion about the effect of the period. So that we said that if you make the period smaller, the diffraction orders spread out more. So the diffraction angle is inversely proportional to the period, actually the sign of the diffraction angle. Uh, we didn't say anything about wavelength. Uh, so of course the wavelength appears in the numerator there which means that if you have light of multiple colors, then longer wavelengths will focus at a longer angle. So this is what you see on the last slide that I posted today in the revised notes. So I have a grating here which is illuminated by white light. 
So, of course, white light is composed of a broad spectrum of colors ranging from uh, somewhere in the infrared to somewhere in the uh, uh, ultraviolet. Anyway, let's take, uh, let's take the discussion, let's keep it to the visible wavelength. So, of course, the red wavelength has a longer color, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the red color has a longer uh, wavelength. So, therefore, the red color is diffracted at a larger angle than the blue. So this, this phenomenon is called dispersion, very similar to the gradient dispersion, but it is referred to as anomalous because it is the opposite of the gradient. So in the, uh, I'm sorry, it is the opposite of a prism. What am I saying? L let me start over. So in the case of a prism, as well as in the case of a gradient, the phenomenon of analysis of white light where white light, after propagating through the element, gets decomposed into its color component, and each one color component propagates at a different angle, this phenomenon is referred to as dispersion. And the two are different in the sense that in the case of a grating, the blue light is diffracted at a smaller angle than the red light. That is called anomalous dispersion. In the case of a prism, it is not diffraction anymore, it is a refraction. And we saw why it happens. This has to do with the dependence of the index of refraction of glass on wavelength. And the dependence is such that the blue light is refracted at a larger angle in the case of a prism. That is called normal dispersion as opposed to the anomalous. Now, there's nothing anomalous about the grating, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Historically, this had to do with the fact that people observed this phenomenon with prisms first, so they call it normal dispersion. Then they noticed that the grating does the opposite thing, so, thing, so they said, well, this is abnormal, right? They called it anomal anomalous. Anomalous in Greek means abnormal. So, anyway, so this is what I wanted to add to Monday's lecture. Are there any questions about gratings or? Okay, so today, I will uh, actually, between today and next Wednesday, we will cover the basics of diffraction theory. Uh, and uh, the rest of the class will be basically applications on what we cover in these three lectures. So needless to say, these three lectures are very, very uh, important. So I'd like to start with a, with a little observation on our Fresnel propagation formula. So to remind you very briefly, today I will be using uh, the whiteboard a lot. So, so, but the equations that I write are all of them in the, either in the notes or in the textbooks. So, in, so feel free to copy them if you like, but you don't have to. It may be better if you, you know, anyway, it's up to you whether you want to copy the derivations or not. But there will be a lot of them. So you'll get uh, probably by the end of the lecture, your, your wrist may be a little bit tired, but okay. So to remind you, um, uh, we said that uh, we did this uh, about a week ago. We said that uh, if you have a complex field at a plane x, y, and then you propagate by a distance z, then at the output plane x prime, y prime, the field is given by this convolution integral, which I will rewrite here. So the field at the output, after propagating by distance z, equals some constants. And we'll spend some time talking about these constants, times what we call the convolution integral. So the convolution integral is really written like something like this, e to the i pi Okay. 
So this is the integral within the Fresnel and scalar uh, approximations. Then what we can do is we can let's take this uh, this exponent and expand it. So I will only do it for the x case. Okay, that's not rocket science. That's just expanded the, the binomial. Uh, now, uh, let me remind you. So the x prime coordinate is at the output plane. And also you can see that it is not participating in the integration. The integration is with respect to x. So the x prime part will actually be thrown out of the integral. And then I have uh, this remaining part. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the input field is finite. So finite means that, uh, that um, uh, the field, if you look at the input field here, the field is non-zero in a relatively small region near the optical axis, but then away from the optical axis the field becomes zero. That is a reasonable assumption because most objects that we, we can create in real life are finite. Uh, we said this before, I think. We deal with things like plane waves and spherical waves in this class, which are infinite, but these are idealizations that we use in order to make the math uh, simpler. In this case, let, uh, let's use actually a real life assumption, which is that the object is finite. And uh, since the object is finite, x will be confined to relatively small values. So what I will do now is I will look at this expression x prime over lambda z. This is this part of the exponent. And what I will do now is I will allow z to become very large. Now, so what does this mean? It means that I start propagating further and further and further away from the transparency. Of course, x is limited by the size of the input field. So x squared is also limited, but z grows as I propagate further away. So there will come a point where um, x squared maximum will become less than lambda z. That is, uh, the maximum value of this fraction over here will become less than 1. And in fact, if I keep propagating further and further, this term will actually grow less and less and less. OK. If that is the case, then the coefficient, then this term over here will become negligible, which means that I can drop it. OK. So this is what uh, is written in your transparency over here. Basically, I actually did this for, for uh, both x and y. I pulled out the x prime, y prime, and I'm left with this expression over here. So let me also do it on my, on my uh, whiteboard here. So what I'm saying is that uh, g out in the whiteboard, I will not write the y coordinates because it is too much, well, maybe I write them to avoid confusion. OK, so this will now take this form. This got pulled out of the integral because they don't participate in the integration. And then what I have inside looks like this. And what I was saying is that if I let z become uh, long enough, then I can basically neglect those two terms. Now, why do I neglect only these two terms and not the products of y of uh, y times y prime and x times x prime? Why should I keep those two terms? And of course, I forgot something. In both cases, 
in here I should have g sub in of x comma y and the same in here. Okay, you see what I did? Over here I need to, to put the to put the, in, the input field and the same here. Okay. So wh wh why am I keeping this term and uh, I'm not dropping it? If I drop it, it's very easy, right? If I drop it all together, then what I will get is uh, the integral of g sub in, which is like the average of, of the input. Why am I not doing that? If we remove the cross term, then we actually neglect the complete spatial variation of the uh, input field, and it becomes a, like a point elimination. Uh, OK. So I would actually disagree with that. If I neglect it, I will get that g sub out of x comma y prime equals g sub in of x comma y dx dy. So this is a constant, right? It is like the average of this g sub in. So I haven't really neglected it. I have said that it, it gets averaged out at the output. And by the way, that's wrong. That's not true, right? This is a wrong result. My, my question is, why is that wrong? Why do I have to keep the entire formula g out of x prime y prime z? Let me write it properly now. So the question is, why can I neglect the quadratics, but I must keep the cross terms? It's actually a very simple answer. If you all, all you have to do is look at it. Does it mean we are restricting the output field to a limited area? That's right. If you look at these cross terms, they actually depend on the output coordinate, x prime. I haven't made any assumptions about x prime. x prime can be as large as I want and can actually, do so this term can actually dominate the quadratic term. That's the point. This term I can control by making the input transparency relatively small and making z arbitrarily large. However, this term has the x prime in it, and x prime can be actually very large itself. So I can never neglect this term. That, that's, the, that's the point of this, of this argument. Everybody clear on that? OK. So if I indeed neglect this term, then what I will get is that um, uh, g sub out, I think this marker is dead, so I'll move on to the next one. It has some terms which I will neglect, but it is proportional to a quantity that looks like this. which I can also rewrite as I didn't do anything. All I did is I, uh, these parameters here, if you look at these 
coefficient, it does not depend on the variable of integration. Therefore, I can call it something, I call it u. And uh, this integral now, it is probably familiar to you. Uh, if it were in one dimension, it would be immediately familiar. It is a Fourier transform. But it is in two dimensions, so it appears a little bit more complicated with two variables. But uh, actually, well, it is a convention to write, uh, what happened here? To write Fourier transforms as, as um, oh, it is a con uh, to, Fourier, to write Fourier transforms as uppercase. So this is uh, G sub in of u comma v, the Fourier transform, computed at frequencies Something magical happened if I let the field propagate at a relatively long uh, distance. The field that they get at that output plane actually equals approximately the Fourier transform of the input field, which is interesting, and we'll see we'll see uh, a lot of ramifications of that in the next uh, in the next few hours. Okay, let's see this now in, in, in uh, sort of in a calculation. Actually, Pepe showed it in practice, in real life. Last time at the demo, you actually saw this kind of thing happening. What I will show now is some movies, which are also posted in the website, so you can go back and peruse them. So in the movie, you will actually see the Fourier transform slowly developing. Uh, in this case, it is a rectangular aperture, so the Fourier transform is very easy to compute. What I will do, of course, in the movie, there's no Fourier transform. In the movie, all I did is I convolved with a Fresnel propagation kernel for progressively longer uh, distances, and then I put all those frames together and I made the movie. But you will see that as Z grows larger, the aperture develops a small oscillation, but then eventually it develops this pattern that, uh, uh, well, it is called the sync function. And we'll see in a moment that this is actually the special Fourier transform of that function. Maybe let me play that once again. So you will see, if you notice carefully, you will see that you start with a nice, clear, sharp aperture. As we propagate, first we see some diffraction ringing that Professor Shepard described uh, in detail last time. But then this ringing slowly gives away to this cross-like looking pattern. Okay. So you can see it here, it has a very distinct pattern. It has a central lobe and then side lobes expanding along the x and y dimensions. OK, so what is this now and uh, how did it come about? This function, the aperture that I started with, I can describe it mathematically as g sub in of x comma y equals 1 if, um, basically, let me go back. So this function equals 1 if x and y are within this rectangle. Mathematically, we can describe this as x less than the size of the aperture and y also less than the size of the aperture. In general, the two, the, it, it, generally it may be a rectangle, not a square. So I use the different variables, and it is zero otherwise. OK, so it is convenient to, this, to define a function and actually, I, I goofed. Uh, if the size of the aperture is x over naught, then the, upper, the value of the function is 1 for x less than x0. So I, I will, I will uh, explain this in a second. OK, so if I define the function rect this way, So that's the function. It is sometimes it's also known as a box curve. 
And so this would be rect of x. And if I were to plot rect of x over x0, then if I, if I substitute x over x0, 0, 0 here, then it is 1 if x over x0 is less than 1 half. So basically this extends from minus x0 over 2 to x0 over 2, and it equals the value 1 over there. And therefore, the total size of the boxcar is x not as advertised. Okay, and uh, of course, if I define the rect function this way, then my original function g sub in, I can simply write it as, as was done here, as a product Okay. So now what is the Fourier transform of that product? Let me write down the Fourier transform uh, definition. Okay, that's the Fourier transform definition. The first thing that I notice in this case, which is very convenient, is that the integral is separable. I can write it really as a product of two integrals. One of them is in the x dimension. And the other looks very similar in the y dimension. This is not always the case. Many Actually, most 2D functions are not like that, but in this case, we're lucky. Means we don't have to do the whole thing. We can just do the integral for one coordinate, and then we immediately have the answer for the other coordinate as well. Okay, so let's write it then. So we'll just write the one-dimensional integral. Okay. So now let's do one more simplification. I will assume that x0 is unit, is unity, okay? We'll come back and rectify this one, but for now I will just assume it this way to make my life a little bit easier. So if that is the case, if x0 is 1, then we already saw what is the function rect of x over 1, it is this one over here. So it is 0 outside, and it is only 1 between x equals minus 1 half and 1 half. So in that case, then, the, the integral that's the integral. Okay, now there's a simple one to calculate. I don't know how I picked up a not here. There shouldn't be no not. Drop this one. Just e to the i to pi u, right? Nothing here. And uh, so I have u times one half minus e to the i to pi u minus one half. And um, these two minuses cancel. And uh, if I flip this around, it is actually the definition of a sign. So this equals 1 over 
minus i to pi u naught times minus 2i sine of what was here, the 2s also cancel, and I get pi u. So finally, after dropping the remaining constants, I still got a u naught. There's no u naught. Uh, for some reason, my brain puts a naught there. There shouldn't be. So after finally canceling whatever is left, I get sine of pi u over pi u. Okay, so that function by definition is called the sink. And uh, I'll jump ahead in the notes a little bit. You can also look it up in the textbook. The sync function looks like this. Uh, it is in page, uh, I forget which page, around between page 12 and page 14 of the, of the Goodman textbook. This is the sync function. At, uh, at, uh, when the argument equals 0, it, it equals to 1. It has a peak. And then it kind of oscillates, but the amplitude of its oscillation drops uh, inversely proportional to the argument. Okay? So the oscillation comes from the sine. The inversely proportional comes from the u in the denominator. Okay. So this may be a little bit boring for you. For those of you who have taken singular processing, you are probably ready to go to sleep now. But anyway, I will, I, uh, for reasons of completeness, we have to do to go through it. And I will not compute too many, too many Fourier integrals. But in any case, if you are to compute one Fourier transform, that's the one to compute. Okay, so that's it then. This is also the definition of the original rect function that we had, and, uh, and uh, its Fourier transform is the sync function. Now, we're not done yet because I made one more simplifying assumption. I said that x0 equals 1. So what do we do about this x0? Well, does anybody know what I can do about this x0? Okay, what I will do is a change of variable. And I will do it in the general case. Let's say that I have uh, g of u equals the Fourier transform of some general function g of x. So this is then the Fourier transform of g of x. What is the Fourier transform of a scaled version of g of x? Well, that would be something like this. It would be from minus infinity to infinity, g of a x e to the minus i to pi u x dx. And uh, to get rid of this ugly thing here, I can make a change of coordinates. For example, let's say that xi equals ax, then this means that dxc equals a dx, and I can write the integral. So dx will become dxc over a. I pick up 1 over a out here. Nothing happens to infinity. It remains infinity. This would be g of xi e to the minus i to pi. Now, a u. Now, x is also c upon a dx. I haven't cheated, right? This is, this is the transformed integral. So the 1 over a basically keeps me honest here, makes sure that the area of the differential is preserved. The, uh, is also known as a Jacobian. But anyway, that's what it is. And, and um, I can do one more little manipulation here, I can rewrite it like this. And 
And we can recognize now that uh, this integral, let me see if I can fit them both on the screen. Good. Okay. So recognize that this integral is the same as this integral, except with a different variable, with different argument. Right? So therefore, what I derived here is 1 over a, d of u over a. Okay, so this is a property of Fourier transforms known as the scaling theorem. Or sometimes people call it the similarity theorem. And uh, let's see let's see how we can apply it to the to the uh, question at hand. We derived that um, um, the rectangle function, if you fully transform it, you get the sink function. Okay. What I really wanted to get is the Fourier transform of a rectangle which has a size x0. So if I apply now, let me write underneath the, the scaling theorem. It says that uh, g of ax Fourier transforms to 1 over a g of u over a. So in this case, a is identical to 1 over x0. So therefore, the Fourier transform will be x0 sinc of x0 times u. And this is intuitively satisfying because uh, the units here inside the sink, the units are not. Uh, x0 has dimensions of uh, space, um, meters. u is a frequency, so it has in dimensions on, of inverse meters. So therefore, the, what I have inside the argument has no dimensions at all, which is, of course, the way it should be. OK. So this is then um, so I let me play this for one last time. This is how uh, this is how we obtain this uh, function with the central lobe and the side lobe. Is this actually uh, not quite the sink function itself because I'm plotting the intensity here. It is actually sinc squared. So, but uh, anyway, this is where this came from. So, of course, if you multiply the two dimensions, you get uh, a, a sinc in the x dimension and sinc in the y dimension, and then of course you get the product. And the Fourier transform theorem says that the uh, that the far field uh, will actually be the Fourier transform, uh, but with the coordinate the spatial frequency coordinate replaced by x prime over lambda z. So where this is, this is where this came from. I substituted u with x prime over lambda z. So the bottom line is that this is perhaps easier if you look at it uh, uh, heads up. So here is a rectangular function. I only saw the x dimension here with the size of x naught then you can see that uh, um, uh, the Fourier transform, actually the square, the intensity of the Fourier transform, it has this characteristic sink pattern with the central lobe and then side lobes. And the size of the central lobe is inversely proportional to the size of the rectangle. So if I make this rectangle smaller, this size will become bigger. OK. So this is then our first Fraunhofer diffraction pattern, the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern of a rectangular uh, function. Now, of course, there is many different apertures that are of interest in this business. Uh, oh, and this, by the way, is called the sink pattern, as I already mentioned. Eh? Okay. So there's many different patterns of interest. Uh, for example, um, very often in optics, we use circular apertures, lenses, irises, and cameras, most optical systems have a, a circular aperture. In this case, we talked about the blinking or the Poisson spot here, but that's not what I'm interested in now. I'm interested in the far field diffraction pattern. And in this case, you also get a pattern with, um, with a kind of looks like a sink, but a sink with circular symmetry. It is not exactly a sink, 
It is given by a rather nasty formula here. It, it, uh, it is the ratio, first of all, it is all done in polar coordinates. So you see that you get the square root of the sum of the Cartesian coordinates squared. But the function itself is given by the ratio of a Bessel function of the first kind and order one divided by its argument. I will not go into the detail of the derivation here. Uh, Goodman describes it in great detail. So if you're interested, you can go and check it out over there. What I want to, I do want to emphasize is a couple of things. First of all, that is this sometimes by analogy to the sink, this pattern is referred to as a jink. So it is, so the J comes of course from the Bessel J. So we call it a jink, jink function. And more commonly, it is referred to as the an airy pattern. Airy, not because it it uh, sucks air or something like that, but it is actually it is named after someone, some Englishman whose name was Airy. So so airy pattern. And uh, if you compare with the previous one, the previous one. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to endure this animation again. Okay. So the previous one, the null actually occurred at lambda L divided by the size of the aperture. In the case of the jink, there's a factor of um, there's a factor of, of 1.22 that enters the, the calculation. So the null basically occurs at a very similar looking uh, variable. If you make the diameter shorter, the size of the jink will grow, but the null, the zero of the jink, occurs at, uh, at this function, at this value 1.22, which of course uh, comes from the zero of the Bessel function. So there's no, uh, there's no intuition here, it's just where this function happens to reach value uh, zero. Okay. Let me skip this slide and perhaps you can go over it and talk about it later. It basically uh, elaborates a little bit on the issue of, I, I said before that uh, in order to observe the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern, I have to let Z become long enough. I have to propagate the field far enough. So this slide answers the question, well, how far is far? Let me skip it for now. And if we have time later, I will, go, I will come back to it. But what I would like to get started now is a few comments on uh, Fourier transforms themselves and how they apply to different apertures. So of course the Fourier transform is a topic in, in uh, applied math really. Uh, I, I don't want to convert this to, a, uh, to 18085 or whatever it is at MIT that you learn those things. But I will remind you of some of the basic properties. So one is the definition of the Fourier transform. I already wrote it down. Many of you are more familiar with the time domain definition, where the Fourier variable is actually a frequency measured in hertz. Of course, in the, because here we're talking about signals in the space domain, the frequency variable is a spatial frequency, so the units are actually inverse meters. Hertz is inverse second, the units here are inverse meters. Uh, and of course, because uh, we're dealing with two-dimensional uh, spatial variables, it is a two-dimensional Fourier transform, hence it is a double integral. But other than that, it's very similar. The other thing I wanted to remind you is that there's an inverse Fourier transform, which looks very similar, except for a minus sign. So in the exponent here, and of course, the inverse Fourier transform takes you back to the original function. So it's like a dance. You start with an initial function, you compute the Fourier transform, then you plug it into the uh, initial Fourier uh, into the sorry inverse Fourier transform, and you get back what you started. That is sometimes referred to as the Fourier integral instead of an inverse Fourier transform. Okay. So what is this really this Fourier transform? If you look at its real part, and if you have a real uh, function here, basically what the Fourier transform does is it multiplies. This function, it is denoted as red here, uh, g of x, it multiplies with a sinusoid. The real part of this complex exponential is a cosine. So you multiply the function with this cosine and then you integrate. Okay, so why do you do something like that? 
Actually, does anybody know why Fourier came up with this, uh, this kind of uh, transform? What was the context that Fourier, what was Fourier? Fourier was a French mathematician or a French applied physicist, I guess. And he was trying to solve a particular problem. Does anybody know what's the problem he was trying to solve and he came up with this business? Okay, it was the problem of heat transfer. Fourier was trying to, so to solve the problem of what is the temperature distribution between two hot plates, one of them a temperature T1, the other a temperature T2. And actually the answer is not given by a Fourier integral, it is given by a Fourier series. Uh, and uh, if you make the plates go, if you increase the distance between the plates, the Fourier series becomes an integral. So, so this, this entire mathematical arsenal here, it actually came from the field of heat transfer, interestingly enough. Anyway, that is of no concern to us here. The Fourier transform, as many of you know, especially those who do acoustics or uh, signal processing, it has tremendous applications in signal processing nowadays. And of course, it is still used in heat transfer. But, uh, uh, but in, in our context here, it is more signal processing that we will use it. OK, so why do we multiply by a sinusoid? Well, the reason is the following. Suppose that G, our transformed function, is itself a sinusoid. OK, so here is G with a particular frequency U0. And um, so it is a red. So G is the red sinusoid. The Fourier transform uh, kernel is another sinusoid. And in general, they have different frequency, like shown here. So what is the value of this integral, do you know? If the two frequencies are different. If you multiply two sinusoids and integrate them over a very long distance, actually infinite. The, the inter, the, this integral, actually by convention in this class, I don't know if I mentioned it before, by convention, if I don't put uh, bounds to an integral, I mean it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is an infinite integral of two sinusoids with different frequency uh, multiplied. What is the answer? Zero. Zero, yeah. Because uh, the various oscillations, they will cancel eventually, so you get nothing. OK. However, there's a singular case when the inter when the when the frequencies are the same. And what is the value of this integral in this case? Well, infinite, right? Because uh, if you multiply them, this will be positive. This will also be positive, because you are multiplying two negative quantities. So you actually get infinity, which is not very good. But in mathematics, we have a way of dealing with these kinds of abrupt infinities. We call them delta functions. And of course, I'm severely abusing the mathematics here. Uh, the way the delta function comes up is, does anybody know? It comes as a limit. The way you get a delta function is you actually bound this integral so that uh, you get a finite value. And then you let the bound go to infinity, and the limit is the delta function. Anyway, without going into these mathematical intricacies, we can represent this situation here as, OK, forget, for, forget the second delta function for a moment. But this situation where the, the value of the integral is 0 for all frequencies except 1, in which case the integral assumes a huge value, then we write it as a delta function. And uh, why we get two delta functions? Well, we get two delta functions uh, because the, um, the way this works is if you take the Fourier transform of an exponential, This is a single delta function. Now, if you take the cosine, of course, the cosine is a sum of two complex exponentials. And now we know how to deal with this. Each one of those is given by an expression like this one. 
So you actually get two symmetric delta functions. Okay, so what is the one half here? Well, the one half is actually the energy contained in this delta function. And, uh, and um, the other thing, so that's normal. The thing that is a little bit weird about this is that this sort of situation implies that there is such a thing as negative frequency. Of course, there's no negative frequencies. The frequencies can only be positive. The reason we need the negative frequency is actually for mathematical rigor because we insisted on using phasors. You remember a long time ago when we started talking about waves, we said that waves are real, so they are actually cosine functions. But for mathematical convenience, in order to avoid complicated trigonometric calculations, we represent this cosine function as a complex exponential. Well, if you really had a simple cosine transform, so you use the cosine in the kernel of the Fourier integral, that is known as a Fourier cosine transform, and then it contains only positive frequencies. But it's nasty to calculate, gives you very ugly formulas, so that's why we use the complex exponential. It is simpler formulas, but the price we pay is this weird negative frequency. So there's nothing to worry about. It is not wrong physics in any way. It is simply a matter of mathematical convenience that leads to these uh, negative frequencies. Okay. And of course, um, I will not go through all these derivations over here, but several functions, their Fourier transforms can be computed in closed form. In fact, all of these functions, you can go ahead if you like and do the Fourier transform by yourselves. It is relatively simple mathematical exercise. So we will use some of these very often. Mostly we'll use the rectangular function. I already talked about this one. We use the circular function. I talked a bit very briefly. Then there is the triangular function, which has a sort of a grayscale. It starts from zero, then progressively goes to one, and then drops back down to zero in linear fashion. And uh, the comb, the comb is a sequence of delta functions that is very useful in sampling. Uh, I don't use it very much in this class, actually. I sort of bypass the issue of sampling. But I'm sure all of you are familiar with Nyquist sampling rates, Nyquist frequencies, and so on and so forth. So these are all that can be explained by the comp function. And Goodman has a section in the book. I forget where it is, a section two point something. Yeah, section 2.4, two-dimensional sampling theory that goes over it. I, I will not go over it, over it in the class. But it's, it may be a good idea for you to, to review it. Okay. So as I said, there is a list of there's a sequence uh, there's a several functions here whose Fourier transforms can give, can be computed. I will I will not go through all of these, uh, but uh, it is good for you to know where this kind of thing is in the book. So when necessary, you can refer to them and you can uh, get the answers for various Fourier transforms. So for example, here's the rectangle function that we computed before, and of course it gives the sink. Response. Another one worth remembering is a Gaussian. The Gaussian function actually also Fourier transforms to a Gaussian, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and uh, another useful one that we will uh, deal with later is this one. If you look at the row before last, it also looks like a Gaussian, but with a J here. So this will recognize, physically, what is this function? It is a complex quadratic exponential. Physically, what did we call it? If I write it in a slightly different form, you recognize it right away. What is this? Spherical wave along z. It is a spherical wave propagating a distance z. So what you see over there is actually a spherical wave, 
with a slightly weird definition, a squared equals 1 over lambda z. Eh? So this expression here in the row before last is a spherical wave. So its Fourier transform is also a spherical wave. And we will use this Fourier transform quite a bit in the, in the, in the next few lectures. It might be good if you start studying, by the way. If you don't know what this is, it means you haven't studied. And I don't know how you, how you did the homework without studying, possibly by copying from the last year. But I strongly recommend that you don't do that because, uh, well, you know, you're presumably here in order to learn. And you don't learn unless you study. So, so, so it is about time, not because of the quiz, but anyway, the quiz is also coming up. So it is about time to start studying. Eh? So this is like a friendly advice, I guess, from an older guy. Study. OK. So the, the other thing that the, the Fourier transform has, it, 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 once we have these basic Fourier transforms that are shown here, then we can compute even more Fourier transforms by using the various properties of the, of, uh, of the Fourier transform. So one of those we already derived. This is the scaling theorem. I did, uh, did this at the beginning of the class. And it tells you that if you scale the argument that goes inside the Fourier transform, then the Fourier transform itself scales the opposite way. So for example, uh, in the case of the Fraunhofer diffraction, it says that if you make an aperture smaller, its Fraunhofer diffraction pattern becomes larger. So this is the scaling theorem, physically and mathematically. Right? Physically, it tells you that the Fraunhofer diffraction becomes bigger. Mathematically, it comes from this scaling property of the Fourier transforms. Another important one is the scaling theorem, which I will prove a little bit later. Uh, but, uh, but it's also a very important one. And the other very important, actually all of these properties are very important. Number four is actually energy conservation. It relates the modulus, the, the, the integral of the modulus of a function. We recognize this as energy. If you look at number four, magnitude g squared is actually uh, intensity. And if you integrate intensity over uh, the entire plane, then you get, of course, energy flux. You get power. And power has to be conserved. So this is what this theorem says. Very important, Parseval's theorem. And um, the convolution theorem is also very important. We'll see an application a little bit later today, or maybe Monday if we run out of time today. But, but anyway, all of these are, all of these are uh, very important. OK, so I will show you some, uh, some um, Fourier transforms uh, to sort of uh, review some of the properties. So are we still on? Yes. Thank you. OK. So this is a sinusoid. Of course, this is not a physical transparency, right? Uh, uh, actually, we can, one can make a physical transparency like this, but this assumes negative values. So it means that to make a physical transparency like this one, you would have to have a phase delay as well as, uh, as um, um, uh, a grayscale variation. What I'm trying to say is that um, if you have a cosine 2 pi u x, its magnitude goes like this, right? And its phase what is the phase? What is the phase of a cosine?
What is the phase of a positive real number? What is the phase button? Someone said zero here, yeah. And that's correct. What is the phase of a negative real number? Hmm? Okay, someone here suggesting zero. Negative real number. 180 degrees. Pi, that's right. So therefore, the, the phase of the, uh, of the cosine is zero where the cosine is positive and jumps to pi when the cosine is negative. Right? OK. OK, so that would be a very difficult transparency to make, right? Because you would have to have the grayscale variation like this to impose the amplitude variation, to am the amplitude modulation, and then you would have to impose some variable phase delay also in order to impose the complex, uh, the, the phase delay. So that is difficult to do. But anyway, mathematically, we can write anything we like. So this is the cosine, and its Fourier transform, of course, consists of two Delta functions, so this is what these bright dots indicate, delta functions whose spacing equals the inverse of the period of the cosine. And of course, if you squeeze the cosine, uh, since the spacing equals the period, then the, the, the two delta functions will go further away. Another way to describe the same is, of course, by the scaling theorem. If you squeeze, it's equivalent to scaling by a quantity uh, um, uh, larger than one. And therefore, the spacing will also scale by a quantity larger than one. Uh, what is a more physical transparency that we saw in the previous lecture? I said that this is difficult to do because you have to impose both amplitude and phase variation. On the transparency, a binary, what is a, more, a binary a transparency. Binary, that's right. That's right. If you had a transparency whose magnitude looks like this, goes between zero and one. That is fine, right? I can do it very simply by taking a piece of glass, and I can deposit some metal, for example, aluminum or chromium or something like that, in these regions, in these regions I will get, z oops, you cannot see what I wrote. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that, I pushed the button here that I should not have pushed. Okay. So, so in these regions where I have deposited the metal, the transmissivity goes to zero. Another way, another transparency that we saw, and it is also physical, is this one. That was actually the first example that we did on Monday. Okay, how do we express this transparency? Is it cosine? Huh? Is it uh, one half plus one half cosine? Yeah. Because it swings between zero and one, right? So this this will do it. And uh, its Fourier transform of this one, how would it be different than the Fourier transform of the cosine that I have on the on my slide here? What 
What is the Fourier transform of this one? So you have a DC yep. component. You have yeah. a D DC component, and then, yeah, uh, the magnitude of the that frequency is half of it. So in this representation. I would still have the two delta functions at space in right, but also in addition, I would have an extra spot in the center, and this spot would be brighter. So the power that goes into the spots, the spots correspondingly, would be one half, one four. One four squared. Okay. So the spot that goes into the center is what you very correctly referred to as the DC term. And now, of course, we know why we call it DC. I think I mentioned it also last time. Is because it corresponds to zero frequency. So in uh, electrical signals. Uh, the zero frequency is known as the direct current, or DC, DC component. Okay, now without cheating, that is without looking at the next uh, page of the notes, I would like to ask you and see if someone can guess. If I rotate this grating by some angle, what will happen to the Fourier transform? Yeah. It, if you rotate it by 90 degrees, I'd expect the frequencies to rotate by 90 degrees as well. That's right. So if you rotate by 90 degrees, you expect the two spots to appear along the v-axis rather than the u-axis. If you rotate somewhere in between, where would the spots go? They will also rotate in what fashion? Okay, so the observation to make here is that the two spots, if you draw a line that connects the two, the two Fourier delta functions, this line would be perpendicular to the fringes of the grating. And this will remain true as you rotate the grating, right? Because actually the Fourier transform does not know what the coordinates are. So, so the Fourier transform knows that you have a variation along this direction and that gives rise to the two delta functions in this direction. In this, in the vertical direction, there's no variation. So therefore, the Fourier transform is confined to the zero frequency. So if you rotate the grating, then the, these spots will rotate so that the line connecting them remains perpendicular to the fringes. This may not show quite right because of because um, the projector actually squeezes my my slide, so it may not show quite right. But if you think about it, you you should convince yourself that the two spots should be located along a line perpendicular to the grooves of this uh, grating. And of course, if you squeeze the grooves in this rotated grating, then the two spots will also move away again along the same line perpendicular to the grooves. Any questions about that? The other property of the Fourier transform, which is listed in the table of formulas that I showed earlier, is linearity. And linearity says that uh, if you have a function that is the linear superposition of two functions, whose Fourier transform you know, then the Fourier transform of this function is the linear superposition of the two Fourier transforms. So for example, here the function consists of two gratings of period lambda 1 and lambda 2. The grating of period, the gra which one is the Fourier transform? That's the Fourier transform 
of the long period, right? Because the two spots are close together. If you take the Fourier transform of the short period, the Fourier transforms are further apart. If you do the superposition now, what you get, well, it is a bit, right? If you superimpose two uh, frequencies, you get a bit pattern. Here it is. Looks kind of messy. The Fourier transform is relatively cleaner. It is the two dots that you get from this one plus the two dots that you got from the other one, so therefore you get four dots total. That's what the superposition theorem says. Of course, you can generalize. I don't know if you can see in Boston, on the top right here, there's a bunch of, of dots. These dots, actually, each one of those, they're symmetric along the axis, so therefore they correspond to sinusoids. And uh, the superposition of sinusoids looks very messy here. It is still periodic, but messy. Of course, if you look at it in the Fourier domain, each one of those is represented by its own individual uh, pair of delta functions. But of course, this is discrete now. What is even more interesting is that uh, if, you, if you were to connect all these delta functions and get a continuous Fourier transform, then your original pattern over here in the space domain would become non-periodic. So you can see it very clearly. Here I have discrete, a discrete Fourier transform that corresponds to a periodic pattern. George, could so you draw? Could you draw? Could you draw the Fourier transform and the uh, overhead projector? Because we cannot see it. It looks dark, totally I dark. Here. It. Okay, I cannot quite draw it, but I can sort of cartoon it. So the cartoon would be dots like this. something like this. So each pair of dots corresponds to a, a cosine. And then what you see on the top left is actually the superposition of all these cosines. OK. And of course, you can have sort of more general uh, transparencies. Uh, you guys are too young to remember this, but uh, but uh, about um, in 2006, I believe, uh, the Boston baseball team uh, beat the Yankees after 85 or 86 years or something like that. They managed, they finally managed to beat them again. And the night of the game, uh, this is the Prudential Tower. For those of you who live in Singapore, this is the, I think it's the tallest building in Boston. And uh, so that night, they lit up the lights in the offices in a way that if you looked at the pattern, you could see the sign go Sox. The, the Boston team is called Red Sox. And of course, the Fox 25 is the, is the TV channel that sponsored the, the match. So anyway, so, so I took a picture with my camera. I, I can see this tower from where I used to live in Boston. Anyway, so this is a picture. And uh, if you represent it as a transparency, so that is the bright spots correspond to transmission of light, the dark spots correspond to blocking the light, then you can take its Fourier transform, and you can see a sort of a, a more general pattern that looks like this. What is interesting is that if you look carefully at this pattern, and I don't know if you can see it in Boston, but the pattern here looks kind of diffuse, but there's some distinct spots, actually quite a few of these spots. Can anybody guess where these spots came from? Um, some of the features in the image, I guess, have um, straight lines that kind of act like, you know, a box function, but not completely. So maybe you're seeing, or, or sorry, maybe you're seeing like, uh, sorry, other way around. You're seeing. Um, Basically, periodic structure in the image on the left gets reflected as spots uh -huh. in the Fourier domain on the right. That's right. Yeah. The, the building has a regular spacing between the windows. So you see a very clear periodic pattern here. It is modulated by the Go Sox uh, uh, illumination, but nevertheless, 
Even the dark windows are visible in the picture, right? Dark windows. Some of the windows, they turn on the light, some they didn't, right? But still you can see the, the, the windows even if the lights were off. So this gives a rise to a periodic pattern. And of course, the full transform of a periodic pattern, as I said before, is a, a sequence of dots corresponding to the Fourier series coefficients. So that's why you see this very nice distinct uh, dots over here. It is the windows in the high rise. There's also more periodicity. This is a roof that uh, also is periodic, right? You can see a grating here. This grating should be visible as a pronounced. Can you still hear me? I keep dropping the yes. microphone. Thanks. Um, the grating here should be visible as a, uh, it must be one of these pairs of dots that do not correlate with the building. That is the, the pattern on the roof uh, over here. This is a roof of, of another building. OK. Now let's look at the, at the um, various theorems. I've already said this before. So that's the similarity theorem. If you compare the Fourier transform of two rectangles, one small, one big, the Fourier transform will have the opposite behavior. The small rectangle will give rise to a large Fourier transform. The other one that I wanted to describe is this one, which is uh, the shift theorem. So the shift theorem, we I briefly we briefly glanced over it in the earlier slide. So let me let me remind you what this earlier slide said. So the shift theorem goes like this. Let's say that. Um, I will do it in one, dim in one dimension only. Then let's say that uh, g of x has a full transform g of u. The question is now, if I shift g of x by some amount x naught, what is the full transform? OK, so we do the same uh, thing. We know that since this is true, since this is true, we know that uh, g of u equals that is the definition of the Fourier transform. Now the question is, what is uh, this one? So this one, uh, the Fourier transform of the shifted function will be given by something like this. This is, of course, the same Fourier transform, but now I plugged in the shifted function. And um, in order to bring it to order, again, I will do a coordinate transform. And this is very easy because, again, the, boundary, the bounds of the integral are minus infinity infinity. They don't change upon the transformation. Uh, the integral doesn't change either. I mean, the differential doesn't change either. The only thing that changes is here, so you'll get uh, integral so x equals c plus x naught, right? Because this you recognize is the same as this. Okay, so this is the shift theorem. So now, why is it related to this one? Well, um, this one, if I draw a cross section,
it will look like this. What I did, I drew a cross section along the vertical axis, right? So let's call the vertical axis X. So this is one. What is this? Well, this is a rectangle. Okay, we know this one, and we computed its Fourier transform. If you look at this one, it is also a rectangle. The size is the same if this is x naught. This is also x naught. But it is displaced, right? Let's use a symbol for this displacement. Let's call it A. Actually, this would be minus A. And uh, this one Okay. So let's see if we can apply the, the shift theorem. Actually, we have to apply two theorems here, the shift theorem and the scaling theorem, right? Which one should I apply first? Okay, let me let me start. Uh, let, let's do one thing at a time. So let me write this function down. So g of x equals okay. It contains three, com each one of those corresponds to the three rects. Okay. Now I want to take the full transform. So one I've already done. It's this one. I guess I'll use the red pen. This one we computed earlier. It is x naught sink of u x naught. What about the other one? First of all, linearity says that I can just add them, right? So that's easy. Yes? They're, uh, they're going to be the x naught sink of u of x naught, but shifted by e to the i 2 pi a and all that other stuff. That's right. So. I will get this one for this term times the shift according to the shift theorem. And similarly, with a minus sign, because here the shift is in the negative direction, so we'll get a uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, the minus sign belongs here and the plus belongs here. Okay, so get a common term in all of this. Okay, one is a plus, the other is a minus. <clears throat> okay, 
So does this explain now what you see here? It's a one plus cosine. That's the... right. This is And indeed, in this calculated pattern, this actually the way I did this, I, I used the FFT2 function in MATLAB. And you can see that FFT2 correctly produced a sinusoidal modulation here, which is imposed by the shift theorem, really. So it's very interesting. The, the, if you translate uh, the, the, the original function, you, uh, you get this uh, sinusoidal modulation in the Fourier transform. And now, because we have a superposition, an interference, really, of sinusoidal modulations, that's why we get the, the well, these fringes in the, in the Fourier transform uh, pattern. And of course, if you rotate this pattern, then the fringes also rotate by the same token we said before, right? Because now, in this case, the displacement is both x and y. So you will get a complex exponential in the rotated case. When you go to the Fourier space, you will get, uh, due to the shift theorem, you will get a complex exponential of the form e to the minus i 2 pi ax plus by, where, for example, this is a and this is b. OK? So when you do the superposition of these uh, complex exponentials, you will get rotated fringes. In the, Fourier, in the Fourier transform pattern. Okay. Any questions? OK. The last thing before we quit for tonight or for this morning is uh, the convolution theorem. And that's a really, really important one that you probably remember. I don't know, maybe you remember it with horror, or maybe you remember it with fondness. But anyway, whichever the case may be, you may remember from your uh, systems classes. So the convolution theorem says that um, if you have a system, Uh, whose input is g sub in of x, and the output is g sub out of x prime. A linear system is actually the output is expressed as a convolution. Okay, and you may be more familiar with seeing these convolutions in the time domain, but it doesn't matter. In, in, in the case of optics, we're dealing with space domain signals, so we simply swap T with X. But it's actually the same idea. So we already saw an example of this convolution in the case of Fresnel propagation. If you remember, Fresnel propagation was G out of X prime Y prime proportional. It had some additional terms in front. But the integral that we got was something like this, g sub in of x comma y
So it is really a convolution where this function h of x, y What is this again? What is this physically? It's a spherical wave. Phaser. Thank you. Okay. So the convolution theorem says that um, if you take Fourier transforms of everybody, so you Fourier transform this one, you call it G sub in of u. You Fourier transform this one, you call it G sub out of u. You Fourier transform this one, Okay, then the convolution theorem says that this equals g sub in of u times h of u. Okay, that's the convolution theorem. So it says that if you in, in the space domain you have a convolution relationship, then in the Fourier domain you simply get a multiplication. And actually that also goes the other way around. If you have a multiplication in the space domain, you have a convolution in the frequency domain. We'll, we'll, we'll get to, do, to use that a little bit later. Does anybody want me to prove this? Do you believe it or should I prove it? Well, let me prove it. Since we're in the mood of math today. So let me rewrite the convolution integral. Actually, before I do that, let me write down the Fourier transforms. Okay, similarly, Okay, so these are really all uh, the same. <clears throat> um, now let me write the output. Ah, okay, and, and by the same token, these are the Fourier transforms. I can also write the Fourier integrals in the inverse fashion. So for example, I can write G sub in of x equals integral g sub in of u e to the plus i 2 pi ux du. If you recall, we call this the inverse Fourier transform or the, for in, or the uh, Fourier integral. And by the same token, I have h of x equals a similar looking integral for h of u and g sub out, again, similar looking integral for g sub out of you. Okay, these are just definitions so far. I haven't really done anything. Now let me write out the convolution integral. What I will do now is a little bit horrible, but um, you will see the logic of it in a second. I will substitute the Fourier transform. Actually, I'm sorry. I will substitute the Fourier integral inside this relationship. So how many integrals do I get? I get three, right? I get one that I had, and then each one of those will be written as an integral. So here are the three integrals. That's the original one. Then for G sub in of X, I substitute its own Fourier integral.
and the same for H. You have to be a little bit careful. H is computed in this shifted coordinate, so it is x prime minus x du. Okay. Now what I'll do is, uh, assuming that these functions are well behaved and so on and so forth, I will actually interchange the order of integration. Let's see if I can do it in a way that it all fits here. Okay. Okay, let me be a little bit more careful here. The dummy variable u is in the same in the two integers. So to avoid confusion, I will actually label them. I will call this u1 and this u2. Okay, so now I have the du1, du2 integrals. And what's inside g sub in of u1, h of u2, and all of this is multiplied by a x integral. So what do we have? So for x, I have u1 from this term and minus u2 from this term. And what's left, there's a, this thing left over, right? So let me not forget it, e to the i 2 pi u2 x prime. x prime, of, of course, is not plain, so, so I, I, I just leave it there. It is not plain in the integration, that is. Okay. So now what is this? I, I put one too many dx's. Okay. So what is this? It is the Fourier transform of an exponential over, remember, these integrals without bounds, they only go from minus infinity to infinity, right? So if I integrate an exponential from minus infinity to infinity, what do I get? We said it earlier this morning. Your tuition is ticking away one second at a time. Well, it's now 25 according to my clock, so I guess we'll stop here. And I'll let you ponder this on your own. Okay? See you on uh, Monday.